uh, Heavenly Parents' guidance to each and every one. So, Patrick, would you like to open the prayer? Thank you so much. <coughs> uh, dear Heavenly Parents, true parents, um, thank you so much that we can gather here. A very diverse group of blessed family members, all connected to our true parents. And uh, on this Easter Sunday as well, uh, we can catch a bit of the spirit of resurrection. And, and for each of us in our lives, we can use this evening to open our hearts and gain some direction for the time ahead and to feel the importance and the uh, possibility that we always have to renew ourselves, to make a new start, and to really seek your guidance and uh, to be open to receive your love. So we'd like to um, pray that you can be present in this room we, through our um, attitude and our um, attendance. We can create an atmosphere where the spirit is really free and where our hearts can be touched and we can uh, feel connected uh, to each other and to you. Uh, so let's say thank you and I pray um, this on behalf of all blessed and families represented here. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so let's give a warm round of applause before he even speaks. <laughs> Religion generally, 
of anybody in my family. I think I went to church the most because I got into church choirs. And I love to sing in the choir, and I like to play the organ, studied church organ, but not playing for anybody else. I just enjoy the melancholy of going in there uh, in, in a dark church and playing by myself. So that was kind of uh, something that I love to do. I then got to university. University was studying architecture in Bristol, and that is where uh, I eventually met the movement halfway through my studies. But prior to that, I want to fill in a little bit of history, especially for the year before that, because I feel it's very instrumental to my meeting the movement and my getting ready, in a sense, to, to be able to join the unification movement. And that year before, it was at the end of the first year of architecture studies, and a friend and myself had organized to, at, with great difficulty, get hold of this student visa, kind of student exchange program that allowed you to go for a certain time in the summer to America and be employed. Right? And a certain number of American students would come to UK and be employed. So we enlisted on this scheme, we uh, got the visas and everything. And at the last minute, my friend couldn't go. So probably assumed that I wouldn't go either, but I felt I had to go. This was a big kind of necessary adventure. And I kind of knew it wouldn't be a holiday, and it wasn't really a holiday, although I saw pretty much a uh, uh, large amount of America, which is very interesting. Um, but I felt I had to go as a kind of challenge. As it turned out, I think maybe Maybe it was prepared that I might even meet the movement there in America, as at that time uh, many young people did. This was in uh, 1975, or 74 in this case. There was a lot of activity in America at that time. So, but I didn't. I didn't meet the movement when I was over there. It was the year later when I came back to the UK. And still this journey to America was very important for me personally, I think, to face something of the reality of kind of world out there, because I had, I suppose, quite a protected uh, upbringing, and I certainly had never taken myself abroad uh, before, just by myself, I mean, on school trips, but not just by myself, because I was basically quite scared of foreigners. <laughs> you all like to know. I'm not anymore, don't worry. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'll go to America, but at least they speak English there, so maybe, you know, I'll, I'll survive. But actually, you know, the character-wise, it's quite different in America to the UK. So I had this uh, visa, and I got uh, to New York, and I spent almost all my money on a go-anywhere bus ticket, with the Greyhound <laughs> buses, so that I could sleep on the bus at night and wake up the next day in another city uh, with my backpack and I could walk around and I could uh, observe life there and then at night get on another bus so I didn't have to uh, spend much uh, money or time in hotels or, or you know, thinking where to sleep. So that was the lifestyle, all working my way across America. And I had a goal because some family friend of ours had put me in touch with somebody who uh, had, had connections with a, a casino in Lake Tahoe City, which is on the kind of Reno, Nevada border. And that was where I was heading. I had various adventures along the way. So for me, looking back, it's more like Jacob going to Haran, actually, because I had not so much a holiday, but a lot of tests. And one of my tests came at the end, as I got to this place, Lake Tahoe City. It's about a mile high, it's a very beautiful lake very rarefied atmosphere, but it's also this kind of city of gambling, very curious places, right? 24-hour, you know, gambling. And I was going to work in one of these casinos as a busboy, which is like the lowest of the low. You're not, you're not even a waiter, you're just clearing tables. But at least I could get food there in the restaurant, anything I wanted, you know, within reason. And uh, I had supposedly a job. But first of all, when I went and signed on, I got the job, that's fine, but they told me, okay, you have to cut your hair, first of all. And it was all right, it was shoulder length, nothing more. You know, but, uh, uh, and I had to shave, I was a bit beardy. 
and I had to go and spend almost my last dollars on a pair of black trousers, white shirt, and get the kit out for, for doing this job. So I did all that, and then they said, well, I had to go to the sheriff's office to get my passport stamped, and otherwise they couldn't officially employ me. So off I went, very unusually for America, walking. Nobody walks there, right? So here was this guy walking. I walked for miles, and already I'd done lots of walking, so the soles of my feet were like big blisters, right? Each foot was kind of one big blister. And I walked all the way to this sheriff's office in the heat, and eventually got there, and went through the doors, and big kind of empty office with one very large sheriff with a Stetson hat on, sitting behind a desk. It was almost like you see in the cartoons, but there he was, I walked up. I could hear my own feet plodding as I got to his desk. I said, you know, I need to have my uh, uh, passport stamped because I'm going to be working here. He looked at the passport, and he looked at me, and he threw it down. He said, you can't work here. <laughs> that was it. Can't work. <laughs> so like for the first time in my life, I think, I had to kind of stand up for myself, you know. I said, I'm sorry, but, you know, I've gone to a lot of trouble to get this visa. I can work here, and I'm not going to leave your office until you've, you know, confirmed that. I kind of, I, otherwise I'd be stuck. I had almost no money left, and I was in, you know, this uh, faraway part of America. So, um, anyway, he checked on the phone, and then she said, yes, okay, I can work there. So, walked all the way back. Actually, I didn't get home that time. I had to sleep in the woods, because... Uh, it was too long a walk and it got dark and I was, had this fitful night's sleep on a rock with kind of very clearly animals moving around. But I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know what animals those were. Uh, I didn't think. But anyway, I eventually got back and I had this job in the daytime but I had no money and they, they wouldn't pay me until I got a social security number. So I had to send off for that, write off for that, wait the security and the social security number to come. So all these kind of tests along the way. I actually didn't get paid there until the very last day that I was employed. So I slept on the beach, nice beach, but not great to sleep there, to be honest. And uh, eventually someone in the, uh, um, a mother of uh, a few sons took me into her home and I slept on the floor. So people, I met people who showed a lot of genuine heart and uh, I met some other strange characters as well. So this is my, uh, experience and as I arrived there I'd gone out to do this uh, shopping to get ready for the hotel job and I spent my last dollars on these trousers and everything plus what must be the world's cheapest tent uh, and that was basically like a, a yellow plastic bag <laughs> big bag with open ends, so it was a kind of a tube and a piece of string. <laughs> and the piece of string you had to tie between two trees and then climb inside this yellow endless bag. But I was so tired, I couldn't even tie it to the tree. So I just got inside this yellow bag, curled up, and I was in what was called a campsite. Now campsites, you know, Americans, they won't put tents out with pegs and this kind of thing. They use it for their big Winnebago's. You know what Winnebago's are? Mobile homes, mobile homes, are huge things, right? And there were some kind of parking areas inside the, uh, all the uh, pine trees. And I thought, anyway, that's a good place to settle down and have a sleep. Uh, I must have slept I think, more than 12 hours, I think. I was so exhausted. And I was woken up by somebody shaking me, and he had a plate of food in his hand. Right? And he had this terribly worried expression on his face. Very nice man, but I had no idea what he was on about, right? He was offering me this plate of food, and he was looking so nervous and worried. I said, you know, what's the problem? And anyway, I heard his story. He was uh, reversing his Winnebago, his mobile home towards what he was thought was a pile of garbage. <laughs> this pile of garbage was this yellow kind of plastic mess there, right? And so he was reversing this big, you know, uh, mobile home, and 
he said he heard like a voice shout out to him, stop, like a spiritual voice. He interpreted it as an angel, saying to him, stop. Because he stopped, he got out, he looked and examined under this yellow plastic, and he saw a body. So, that was me, right? So he really thought, you know, if he hadn't heard that, he would have run over me, right? And that would be the end. Actually, I realized that was kind of the end. And I looked at myself, I said, what am I doing? I'm here, lying on the ground, sleeping outside in a, in, in, under plastic. I'm like, you know, like a down and out or a beggar or something. And I suddenly realized, strangely, it was like a, going to a kind of zero point in my life. It was almost like I didn't know how that came about. But all these circumstances, not getting paid and all the rest of it meant that somewhere, you know, I was on this organized trip, but it didn't turn out like that at all. So eventually that, that was fine. I got my wages at the end. I spent it all on another bus ticket going all around America back. And that was a wonderful experience, but quite a, a time of life education, you could say. So, uh, having had that, I remember very clearly on the plane home, I'm not naturally a diary writer and I hadn't written any diary, but I felt I had to record some of these experiences and at least write them down. So, I had a notepad and I had a pen. And uh, I obviously started writing, but I kind of drifted off. And, I don't even remember writing this, but when I looked down, I saw just one sentence, and it simply said, I must bring God into my life. That's all it said. And it surprised me to see that. That was the conclusion of this whole trip. I must bring God into my life. As I said, you know, maybe I could have <coughs> met him from there, maybe I wasn't ready, actually. Because I'd gone to kind of space out in the jargon of the day, you know, kind of just uh, float around aimlessly in places where later on in my uh, church life, uh, working in America, I would go to witness or to do church activity. Very notorious places in the 70s where our brothers and sisters met new members, like Canary Wharf in uh, you know, uh, San Francisco, the kind of park in, in Fisherman's Wharf. And, uh, uh, some main park in Chicago, <coughs> a little uh, kind of concrete garden which is just next, next to our headquarters on 43rd Street. I was kind of spacing up there. All these places I had visited, but nobody talked to me. <laughs> nobody found me, right? and I had the backpack and everything. But, uh, anyway, so I ended up back home, and that was uh, starting the second year of university. At that time, I was starting to get some kind of feelings that even though the architecture studies were going well, um, I wanted to do something different with my life. And I narrowed it down to two things. Either to become a monk, or to become an organ builder. One of these two things I wanted to do. And I was still thinking about that, and not <laughs> sure really, but it was uh, uh, holidays. We just moved in with some friends to a new house, which is quite an effort, so much of one's uh, mental effort went into just the living arrangements with the university. Uh, so there I was, and I remember at that moment, um, very clearly, I was sat on the balcony, nice sunny day, uh, just sat on the windowsill, maybe for the first time really praying a very specific prayer, and that was, God, please show me uh, the wise person in this world, or the wise people. I want to, I really want to find uh, someone, like a source of wisdom, because it all seems so directionless and so confusing, and even, you know, the kind of leadership one sees uh, in the world seems so far from that kind of wisdom that we need. So I remember praying that, and it was just a short time afterwards that I met somebody from the movement. It was the beginning of the holidays, of the uh, university holidays, so... Uh, in a rather arrogant uh, student mood, I decided I'm going to sit down and write a novel. Right? So that was going to be my <laughs> my uh, holiday. Right? So, oh, days of the typewriting, the little desk typewriter. Okay, didn't I? Uh, I got to page two. <laughs> I got to page two, and uh, page two. Then I heard in my ear. 
going over this ear, because it was definitely my right ear, I heard like a voice saying to me, go down to the center of town. Okay, so I did. It said, go down to the center of town. This voice in my ear, spiritual voice. I wasn't surprised to hear that kind of thing. It wasn't very common for me, but at that moment it wasn't a surprise at all. I kind of listened and I just got up from my chair. I went out of the house. I remember turning to look back and see, oh, I've left the front door open. And I just thought, oh, forget it. I just, I just go on, right? I was really following this voice. And I started to kind of ask questions. I said, well, where should I go? <laughs> and the answer that came back was, to the church. And it was a quiet Sunday afternoon, so I just went on down, uh, down the hill, uh, to the kind of green in, in the center of Bristol. And I thought, oh, it must be the cathedral, because I'd gone in there sometimes. I liked the melancholy of it all. Uh, occasionally I'd uh, sit in there and I'd pray or I'd just uh, meditate. So I went towards the doors of the cathedral, and as I got there, uh, I felt a cold wind coming out. I think you often do from these buildings, but uh, it kind of struck me with meaning. So it, it just told me, oh, this is not it. This is not where you're meant to go. So I thought, okay, well, I'm not meant to go there. Where should I go, I'm asking, right? And the voice said, to the church. And I thought, okay. Well, across the green, I knew there was another little church, older church, in a kind of row of shops, and I'd gone there sometimes to space out and feel melancholy. So I thought, oh, that's what I should do, right? <laughs> so off I went across the green, and I got to these doors, and I stood in front of the doors, and as I was standing there, the doors opened. Whoosh. And coming towards me was this bridal party, bride and groom and flashing photographers and all the rest. <laughs> the last thing they wanted to see was me standing there. You know. But... Uh, Again, the feeling that came with it, right or not, was, oh, this is, this is just a kind of people using the church for their own wedding, you know, it's, it's nothing kind of spiritual at all. This is the wrong place. This isn't where I'm meant to go. So I didn't go in there either. And by that time, I'm starting to think, David, this is a bit silly, really, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, you sat down to write this novel, and then you, now you're up wandering around the town listening to voices. So... Why didn't you just go back home? <laughs> so I started up the hill going back home, and that was where I heard a voice from behind, physical voice. This was a young uh, sister from France, together with another sister from uh, Austria, and the kind of French sister was taking the lead, and she said, excuse me, and she said something in broken English about a lecture, something about the problems of society, and would I like to come? Actually, it wouldn't have mattered what she said to me. Because when I turned around and looked at her, I knew this is why I came out. This is why I came out. Very clearly. And normally, because as I said, I was quite a shy person, I certainly wouldn't talk with anybody on the street. No, I wouldn't do that. Let alone when I do what I did next, which is to follow her invitation, this person I didn't know, and go with her on a bus, she said, we've got to go by bus. And we had this long bus journey to Bedminster, which I now know is not such a salubrious place in you know, Bristol, but I was to go there. And um, to go to uh, a kind of storefront shop, disused shop. Uh, no sign outside, but we went in and there was a nice uh, kind of blue carpet on the floor. No furniture, but a nice blue carpet. <laughs> and uh, a board on the wall, like a blackboard, and, and that was it. And I sat on the floor, and amazingly, uh, I listened to maybe an hour and a half overview of Divine Principle from uh, a lady from Switzerland, she taught me, uh, first of all. Now, prior to this time, I think I'd had uh, many questions, and I was really searching. I thought I was, no, Christian by faith, I certainly wouldn't deny God's existence and felt very pained when people um, talked that way, but I felt something was wrong with me because I couldn't really testify about my faith and certain things I couldn't understand, particularly about the notion of salvation. I remember asking various uh, vicars of 
know, what this really meant, and just getting a stock answer, but being very unsatisfied with that answer. What I felt it wasn't really saying it to me. And there were certain things about the, uh, the faith that I had that I felt um, nobody else was really sharing. And just prior to that time when I, you know, I went into the cathedral, I think almost a week before, I'd been to hear Bach's, Bach's uh, Matthew Passion, if you know that, and someone kind of interested in music. That was profoundly moving to me. And it struck me through that music and uh, that, that it was such a tragedy that Jesus should have died and such a wrong uh, thing on the part of humanity that I really couldn't put it all together. I, I remember deciding not to talk to anybody for three days as a result of that. So it took me very much inside myself. But when I heard the principle, all these answers were kind of given to me. I think at the end of that hour and a half introduction, if you asked me uh, what it was all about, I couldn't have told you. Right? I couldn't have really told you. But somehow I felt, as I was receiving that uh, overview to the principle, I really felt, yes, the answers lie there, absolutely. I knew that this was the answer to almost every question I had, and maybe questions I didn't even have yet. So um, I really felt from the outset that this is why I had come out that day. And when I looked for the first time at this uh, sister, um, I felt this is the kind of person which I would like to be, because I was struggling myself with being very false. I suppose it was part of my shyness as well. But I felt I and also my friends around me were very false. We're kind of putting on a, a front all the time. And I was a kind of a nice kind of jokey person and not being so serious maybe. But then almost to a, a great pain in my heart, people I think were close friends would say, you know, David, who are you? We don't know really who you are. And because I wasn't sharing so much about myself. So I felt I don't have really honest, open relationships. And I was longing for that, just to uh, find people who had no pretensions in that way. And when I saw this person who became my spiritual mother, I just felt, this is such a person. Uh, nothing false about this person at all. I could follow this person. Anyway, so uh, I just heard this introduction lecture, and sure enough, uh, sure enough, I been very moved by this, but I saw a little bit of talking going on between my spiritual mother and the teacher, you know, should we, shouldn't we, should we, shouldn't we, you know. And eventually, the teacher came up to me and said, you know, we have a workshop starting tonight, actually. Would you like to come? And I said, yes. <laughs> Straight away, right? Oh, were they a little surprised? Okay. At that time, because it was a time of great revival here, we had the One World Crusade. So, European brothers and sisters were coming. That's why I met a French sister and was taught by a, uh, a Swiss sister. So um, I think that was a great help to me because uh, uh, although I never really so easily related to foreigners, in this instance, I think it was my salvation because somehow I could relate to them and could accept things from them that I found it very difficult to accept from English people, except especially English brothers. Right? Why? Because they were like me. Right? They were very like me in, in character. So they were the most irritating, but everybody else I liked. <laughs> Which is curious, isn't it? But somewhere uh, it's explicable, I think. So they were surprised. Yes, I, I was very enthusiastic. I wanted to go to this workshop. No idea what it was, but I said, can I just, uh, uh, will you just drop by the home so I can get a tooth toothbrush and you know, one or two things? Is it Yes, of course. So I went back to my student house and I said to all my friends, sorry, I'm off. I'll see you later. I'll tell you all about it when I get back. And I was gone. And I went to Cleve House, which is you know, in the West Country, our workshop place. And I went that night. Because of the great focus on witnessing activity with this international team, it meant there were continuous workshops at that time. You know, back to back, two day workshops and back to back seven day workshops. So if you did a 21-day workshop, this was just three seven-day workshops, back to back, and that was eventually what I did, but I had a little bit of a detour in that, uh, 
experience because these were three-day workshops and I was asked to stay for three days and that was fine but um, on the third day I had already arranged to and this was quite a long-standing arrangement to go down to Cornwall uh, long journey and I had a little Honda 50 motorbike hmm. and I was going to go down there to stay with a young couple again didn't know them so well but through family friends I was going to stay with this young man who was a uh, music teacher and he in his shed in the back of his house was making harpsichords so I was going to learn how to make harpsichords right? and I made this arrangement right? it's a bit unusual for me to do that kind of thing but anyway I, I thought I have to honor this arrangement so after two days of the workshop I said to the staff I'm sorry but I have to go and of course I heard all this whispering in those days of <laughs> Satan's going to get him, right? And it's, this is going back into the outside world. So, you know, I saw all their consternation. You know, I, worry. I thought, what, why are you worried? You know, I'll, I'll come back, it's all right. Uh, but I saw they were worried, so I thought, well, maybe I should pray about this. You know, this is what we're learning about. So I went into the orchard next door, the kind of trees, and I just took a little time, and I prayed about this very specific point, should I stay or should I go, right? And the answer very clearly came to me, um, almost like a voice. It was, it's very simple, just stay. <laughs> that was the answer. And I thought, yeah, it's very simple, actually. I just had to, you know, call this uh, couple and just say I'm going to be a bit late and, you know, another day or something. But I never thought of that myself, right? Never thought about it. But, you know, I got a kind of lesson that, you know, when you sincerely pray, sometimes it can change your mind, or you can realize that your mind is actually an obstacle to what God wants you to do. So, uh, I got that little change of mind. They were surprised to see me back in the lecture room. They're quite happy, right? They thought, oh, they thought you were going. No, no, I don't have to go now. Okay. <laughs> so, that was it. And then after those three days, then I made uh, the journey. I had to leave, and everybody a little bit worried. But I said, uh, could I take with me a divine principle book? Now, this was some time ago. It would be no problem today, but they were thinking, well, should we give him one or not? You know, because you know, this is quite your weighty stuff. And uh, I said, you know, I'll, I'll buy it. Can I, can I have a... Eventually, they gave me this divine principle book. And I stuck it in the pannier bag of the Honda 50. And mm, I went, all the, mm, you know the, what they sound like, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What they feel like. This is, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of miles journey. Uh, I went down to Cornwall. And uh, by the time I got there, my teeth were loose. Because you were <laughs> ripping on all the way. And I wanted, why are my teeth so loose? But, anyway, it was because I was mean all the way along. That's a side story, very definitely. But, uh, there I was, I got to this couple's house, I told them where I'd been, and you know, uh, like, like myself, I'd never heard of unification movement or Reverend Moon or anything like this before, so, you know, that was a kind of uh, advantage for me, I suppose, I had never, I didn't have any opinions, but, um, but uh, what I did have from the workshop was I was just amazed by divine principles. It just was so liberating. And I was so happy to be in an environment where there were people I could just relate to as my brothers or sisters. That was a fantastic liberation to me. And I felt uh, that God was really giving me something so precious. But I was honoring this commitment to go down to Cornwall. When I was there, I couldn't concentrate on, these, <laughs> on, on anything like harpsichords or whatever. No. I was not, was, this book had me. And I put it on this couple's coffee table, and as I walked around it, it was like light was coming out of this book, and it was calling to me all the time. So I'd take it occasionally out to the cliffs of Cornwall and sit in a field and try and read this book, and I couldn't make head or tail of it. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I used to, I heard, in the lecture I heard something interesting about the spirit world. Well, where is that? I was trying to find it in this book. I couldn't find it anywhere. No. So it was very frustrating because I wanted to engage with it, but I couldn't, and yet it... So I asked this couple, actually, you know, I had these feelings, and I met this wonderful group of people, and, and really, you know, I can't concentrate on anything else. What do you think I should do? 
And they both said, well, I think it's probably good if you go back. <laughs> Which was great advice. <laughs> so, <laughs> All the way back, I arrived at Cleave House after midnight. <laughs> and the total place is, is shut up and dark and, uh, you know, but I found a way in the back door. <laughs> Went upstairs, and I climbed into a bunk bed, and when the lecturer came around in the morning, uh, singing these ridiculously happy songs, you know, yeah, waking everybody up, it's probably me. He, <laughs> again and I stayed for my seven days, my second seven days, my third seven days. And this time I, I saw you know, some people were uh, joining the movement and uh, others were coming and going, but I felt I had to work up courage, really work up courage. It took me all of a day to be able to stop this main uh, uh, lecturer uh, in the corridor and ask him, uh, question. Uh, that question was, could I join? Because mm. I was sure he would say no. <laughs> because, you know, who, who would want a person like me? This is my thinking, right? So, uh, I, anyway, I said, I have to ask, I have to ask. So I worked up the courage and uh, I asked him the question, oh, would it be possible for me to join the movement? And he said exactly the right thing for me at that moment. He said, of course, it's just a matter of heart. It's just a commitment of heart, he said. And then walked off. <laughs> and I thought, oh, amazing, right? I'm home. I felt like I'm home. You know, uh, and that was it. You know, no signing any bit of paper, or no doing anything. Really, from, from there on, uh, I never looked back. I was you know, soon off to do missionary work. And, I was phoning my parents to say, you know, um, I'm heading off now to, to Germany. So from Germany I told them I'm heading off to France. From France I told them I'm heading off to Japan. Uh, just prior to all this, I, I did have a visit home. You could imagine, in those days, the parents concerned, they'd heard something about the movement, but they never passed those things on to me, because we had a good relationship, actually. They trusted me. And I was very open with what I was doing. And of course, it's a big thing, you know, uh, all that effort to get to university. And I was going to, in a sense, not, I didn't put in terms of totally giving up, but at least taking some years to do missionary work. And uh, particularly my father, who was an architect, and I was studying architecture, uh, I was very touched and very moved by his uh, reaction. He said, um, you know, when I was your age, speaking to me, uh, I had to interrupt my architecture studies, but that was to join the Royal Engineers and go to the Far East, had to go to Malaysia and uh, all the other places to, to be part of the army. And he said, maybe you'll do something much more valuable than that, he said. So uh, he gave me a certain money into the bank and he said, as, as, as if you're studying at a theological college for one year, right? So really encouraged, you know, and supported. Like, if it's, that's what I want to do, or that's what I feel I should do, then, yeah, maybe it's the right thing. So that was great, and I always kept a good relationship with the parents. I sent them, uh, you know, postcards and letters, and when I was abroad in Japan, I just wrote bits of music for them and sent, because they were into amateur music and things like that. Uh, somehow, that uh, kept our relationship uh, sweet. Right? So, uh, even though I seemed to be you know, uh, traveling the world, which I indeed was, uh, when I went to uh, Japan, then as soon as I arrived there, I was only six months in the unification movement, I didn't know much at all, uh, but it was a very beautiful experience to be in a country that somehow is, uh, um, a little more you know, uh, 
philosophical tradition and a very beautiful country. So you are treated a bit like a, a guest all the time in Japan, which is nice to begin with, but after a while it becomes a more uncomfortable. You feel you'd, you'd really like to give more to the culture. But I, as soon as I arrived there, I was picked out by quite a spiritual brother who was in charge of the um, kind of uh, music there and New Hope Singers International. So half of that choir that Father started was in Japan, half was in America. So I immediately, that first evening, was signed up to join the performing arts department in the choir. And uh, we traveled two times around Japan, sometimes a new city every 10 days, and traveling in little microbuses. Microbus, right? Mm -hmm. Very small, you know, kind of big western knees hunched down in front of the uh, seat in front. And traveling all over Japan was a fantastic experience, a wonderful experience for me. Um, we uh, would do a stage show which kind of provided um, a prelude to uh, evangelist, to somebody sharing something of Father's teaching, the divine principle. And we'd go to all these rural communities. Many of them had not seen even Westerners. You know? They'd seen them in films, but never actually seen a Westerner, let alone, say, a, a black American. A uh, very white uh, Swedish sister. We were a very international team, jokingly, because we were always announced on stage uh, along these lines. We would say we were uh, 40 people from 50 different countries, <laughs> because it felt like that. <laughs> and uh, Brother Hayashi was there driving, right, at the time. He was one of our drivers. So, you know, this was an amazing experience for me. I was probably one of the youngest, actually, just a little boy, really. but. And uh, others were kind of uh, spiritually older than myself, but it was an amazing experience living and working very closely together. That was the advantage of this performing arts uh, mission. And we would do some public relations work and all this kind of thing as well. And occasionally we'd go to a little uh, uh, city where, like I guess, it was very unusual for them to see foreigners, uh, but our musical director would. A uh, Japanese musical director would uh, arrange the local folk song, always. And we'd learn it off, really parrot fashion. I mean, there are quite a few Japanese songs. I don't know the meaning of the words, but I know the, the syllables, right? <laughs> <laughs> but we'd learn them off, and we'd practice and practice and practice, and be able to sing these without music. So when the curtain opened, there would be this very international group of people, and we'd s launch into the local folk song. So people would just cry, they would weep, you know, they're singing our song, right? <laughs> right? And it was a very beautiful idea and uh, opened the way for the message at that time. So that was Japan. And then we got called to go and join the other half of the choir for the big Washington Monument uh, rally. Right? So that's 76, September 76. And, uh, I went there and took part in that, and that was also a very great experience. A lot of you know, high-level activity going on in the movement in those days. Um, very excited to be part of that. And then we were asked, uh, or given a choice, actually. Uh, we could either go back to Japan and continue the work there, I've been there for seven months, or we could stay in America. And when who was asked, who wants to stay in America? Then my hand just went up, like that. Really involuntarily. I don't, I don't remember sticking it up at all, right? But there it was, up. And somewhere afterwards, I knew it was because I had to face certain things in America. Japan was too nice, to be honest, right? uh, for a foreigner. So I had to go and experience something to toughen me up a little bit in America. Was, uh, I was still this kind of rather shy, uh, Hugh Grant type of Englishman, you know, voice, you know. And I got thrown into quite intense uh, work. Again, it was with our performing arts department, and um, that sounds all kind of sweetness and light, but we would do all kinds of things. Singing was probably about 13th on the list, because we would, uh, uh, we were kind of pioneering home church, we would be the first on the street selling the News World newspaper when that first came out in uh, uh, New York. And as uh, salespeople, we were using our kind of 
mobile fundraising team tactics. So that would be uh, you know, not coming home until you've sold a certain number of subscriptions. So I remember occasionally selling a subscription to a newspaper to somebody uh, in, a, in a New York bar at maybe one or two in the morning. And the next day you'd have to go and knock on their door and collect the money and give them the first newspaper. And they wouldn't know what it is at all. They didn't remember talking to anybody. They were so drunk at the time. <laughs> you know, so, well, please, just try it anyway. You know? <laughs> Doing all this kind of technique and uh, going uh, around New York. We did uh, home church there and we did that in Washington as well. Uh, we were used as a task force to kind of go to different places. Even when the Manhattan Center, this kind of um, opera house had been bought, it's attached to uh, the New York Hotel there next door, uh, we were the first ones in there kind of scraping the walls and cleaning the plaster. And somebody gave me uh, this uh, spray, like a freezing spray and a scraper, and said, go and scrape the gum off the floor. <laughs> and uh, actually this has been used in its latter days as a, a boxing match, rather low-level boxing fights, I think. So, uh, actually, I, I looked around and I thought, well, where's the gum? And actually, then I realized, oh, it's all gum. <laughs> <laughs> it was a layer that people chewed and spat out their gum, right? And it was just kind of a mess. We had to scrape this off them. So that's the kind of job we were doing, right? But also some more spiritual things, right? Like, uh, home church work and did some of the first ministers outreach work in Washington. So um, Washington was an interesting place and that is where you know, we have maybe something that's recognizably a church because it used to be a Mormon uh, church if you've seen pictures or, or even been there. And uh, we were there when that uh, building was purchased and uh, the choir was asked to move in there he hoped singers, and we would use it as a base, which meant actually sleeping on the balcony. That, that was our bedroom, that was the balcony. And we'd be packed in there, and uh, we would uh, develop the church, work from there. And, you know, in those early days, we had something amongst first gen, we used to call your Isaac. Do you remember that, Jen? Yeah, your sure. Isaac. What was your Isaac? Yeah. Your Isaac was that thing sometimes much to your own surprise, that you found, ooh, that was kind of a little bit difficult to give up. Right? For me, it's maybe surprisingly, it wasn't the studies or the career in architecture or this kind of thing, but it was the organ, the church organ. <laughs> because I looked at how we did things on our workshop. You know, I love the guitar very much, but you know, it was just these kind of happy songs and, you know. Uh, that, that was it, really. <laughs> Nothing else. So at that time, my Isaac was the organ. I thought, I'm never going to be able to play the organ again, because I'll never see a church organ, and we certainly don't have any of those in any of our centers. So I thought, that's it, you know, finish. And that's all right, I could overcome that. So if that's the only thing, then I can do that. Uh, and then, actually, ended up in Washington, D.C., and this church had an organ, quite a nice organ. Nobody was playing it, and nobody knew how to play it. So, one day I plucked up courage to say, actually, uh, you know, I play a bit of organ. Right? So, that was where I started. And, you know, it's interesting how, as we say, things come back to you. Uh, and whereas I'd done that kind of thing, or used music just for myself, and was very afraid to play in front of anybody, Somehow it comes back in a way which can be of more service to, to God and to other people. So uh, we should never fear God is asking us to give up something. Of course, those days, as is characteristic of that indemnity course of first generation particularly, then you always seem to be doing the <coughs> opposite to what was your nature, right? You'd never be slotted into something which was obviously easy for you to do, but that's part of making the changes that one needs to change to get rid of your old self and your bad habits and to try and develop some more rounded character or some aspect of yourself which is undeveloped. So that was like me in America. As I said, a kind of shy person, a little bit uh, thrown into these things like uh, our fundraising where you visit many people or um, stop people as they come 
from the supermarket to their cars or this kind of thing. And here I was with a, a box of different things we were selling, sometimes cactuses, sometimes granariums, little glass jars, sometimes we had uh, uh, sweets, things like after eight mints. And sometimes they'd been in the sun too long. Ever had that one? And you could feel they're really heavy at one end and very light at the other end, right? So they've all congealed in a mess down. But your team leader says, sorry, we, we bought these. You have to sell them. You've got to sell them. So you're going around. You have to make a story up. <laughs> when they open it, they can slice it for themselves, you know, this kind of thing. So anyway, we did these funny things. and. Uh, for me, actually, it was quite difficult. I had absolutely zero training in these things, zero training. But I found myself having to confront myself because in this rather faltering, apologetic British way, I was soon to find out that that doesn't work in America. So I'd be going up to people and saying, um, excuse me, I, I'm terribly sorry, but do you have a moment? <laughs> They'd be gone, you know? <laughs> Uh, I'm terribly sorry, I'm a missionary and I'm, I'm so, and they've gone again, right? And so I was going around, you know, not making any, any kind of result, coming home with a huge headache, right? That was about it. Uh, and then eventually I thought, ah, oh, come on David, let's get out of this somehow. Actually my changing point, big changing point, was somebody volunteered on a Sunday morning and said they were going uh, white water canoeing right, down quite a rapid river. Would anybody like to come? Never done it before in my life. Yes! Right? <laughs> I'll come. Fantastic. So, I, but actually I was feeling, you know, I don't mind if I die doing it. That was how I was feeling at that time. <laughs> I was feeling so miserable <laughs> myself that I thought, okay, anything. <laughs> so, so I went off down this rapid water, and it was so exciting and so challenging with ducking the branches and trying to keep up. I'd never done this before, and it was crazy, really. Anyway, I survived, and it just gave me a kind of feeling, well, what the heck, you know, just go to it. So I decided to try the next day fundraising. Let's pretend I'm just a really uh, a wild American, right? So I put on this hat. I, I went, hey, how are you doing? Good to see you. Right? Want to get one of these? You know? And they go, wow, yeah. You know? It's all kind of great, you know, like old friends. So I was going up to the next one. Hey, how are you doing? How are you doing? You know? And I suddenly realized, this is how you do it. Right? This is how you do it. Initially, it was very painful because this is so un-British. This is, you know, my heart was going, you kind of got into it and realized well, you don't lose anything on yourself, you know, you're still the same shy person underneath, so that's all right. But you can do this. I, I, I did one, I was getting nowhere one day, so I did the whole day at one of these stoplights, traffic lights, going up and down to the cars. What a miserable job. But I just had to make it fun, so I did the whole day as Yogi Bear. A Yogi Bear accent, right? Because when you, when you did it in an English accent, well, people were fascinated. And you didn't make any money. <laughs> Sometimes door to door, I'd knock on the door with my English accent and I'd say, hello, you know, I'm, I'm selling these for, for our missionary work. And, and she, the lady would say, oh my gosh, it's an Englishman. Oh, wait there, I'm going to call my neighbor. In the place, there's an Englishman. <laughs> the neighbor would come around to hear the accent, but they wouldn't buy anything. <laughs> I just wanted to hear the accent, so I quickly said, forget it with the English stuff. Uh, forget this stuff, let's be American. You know, so that was my kind of challenge to get out of my, myself, really. How much God worked to kind of get me out of myself, really. Uh, I mean, I don't think he has time for that for people anymore, you know, because in those days, somewhere, so much was invested into people like myself, who really, when we met them, were, I don't know what we were good for, to be honest, and what I was good for, but God had to kind of knock me into 
shape through all these kind of experiences. Of course, in his wisdom, this is what Father designed and encouraged people to do. This was his thinking. This is very good spiritual training, you know, fundraising and meeting people this way, knocking on doors in a very inhospitable place like New York, you know, where it's really quite difficult in that respect to, to get responses, but in the midst of that you meet precious people, and you meet people who are really, you know, really open up to you. There was one experience where I was doing home church in New York, and uh, it was my kind of area, and I knew these corridors of these apartments very well. Normally it's sometimes hard for somebody even to open a door. You knock on the door and they do little buzzers, and then an eye appears at this little kind of yeah. little lens thing in the middle of the door. You just see an eye, right? And they say, what do you want? He's trying to explain what you want, and they just say, no, go away. Right? <laughs> uh, or if they open the door, it's kind of, you know, one lock, chunk, another lock, chunk, another bar, <laughs> and there's a kind of they're holding back in our section or something. So, you know, it's not the, you know, the most conducive place. But I remember one time, um, just one experience, was um, I was going along the corridor and there was a door that was a little bit ajar. It was open. That's unusual already. And from inside, I could hear the sound of a woman crying, sobbing. And I thought, well, what do I do? What do I do? Do I just go or do I go in or what would you do? You know, and it's, uh, it's a question, isn't it? But I just felt, anyway, what am I here for? I have to go in. So I, I went in. She was on a uh, settee and crying very much, uh, maybe from West Indies somewhere originally, this lady. And I just, she of course didn't know me. I was a stranger, but somehow I just sat down beside her and she put her head on my knee and, you know, she was just so comforted to have somebody there. It was quite extraordinary, really. And um, afterwards, you know, she had said that she was really feeling very suicidal. And actually, if I hadn't come, then maybe, you know, she would have ended her life. But she felt so reassured just to have another human being. So you never know where kind of these kind of precious experiences are going to happen. And God will show you something. And it's, um, you know, just at the moment, it's very much one part of one's own personal kind of journey and experience with God to see uh, the beauty of human beings, the suffering of human beings. And uh, so God gave me many, many experiences like that. So, um, very, I've got three minutes, I think, have I? So, okay. Thank you. I just should say, she's not here with us, but I should say a little bit how I met my beloved wife. This is uh, uh, Mrs. Hannah, is her name. Um, and that was through true parents or true father's uh, suggestion of <coughs> James, we said, in 1979. Right? So I was in America. My wife was from Korea, was in uh, Korea. And she had uh, submitted her photograph for some matching, seeking some suitable partner, right? with Reverend Moon's help, and he, as you know, has this uh, extraordinary insight and ability to uh, match people and be able to pair people together. That's his suggestion. One doesn't have to accept, but uh, I want, you know, I was very happy to, to put myself forward. Although, to begin with, at that matching time, I wasn't expecting to be matched, because according to the criteria, strictly I was too young spiritually and too young physically. They have certain you know, uh, age ages stipulated. So I was actually quite um, enjoying it, because all my friends, I could see them, they were uh, being matched and having partners suggested for them. They were pairing up in this way, and uh, I didn't have to worry, because it wasn't going to happen to me. Right? <laughs> But uh, lo and behold, there was an announcement from my central figure, a very wonderful and kind of deep brother called uh, Brian Saunders. He, he made this announcement over the intercom. All people under a certain age or over a certain age, uh, male in the performing arts department, come to the ballroom right now, right? And actually, he didn't say my name, but he said it was just for me. That was the announcement. 
Luckily, I heard it and I went there. And I was, he immediately said, just go in and sit down. And there was where Father was matching people, right? So sisters on one side and brothers on the other side. Father uh, was you know, having a little difficulty at that time. He said because a lot of people had concepts in their mind. And, um, I thought, I'll just stand at the side. And, you know, I'm not really involved, so I'll stand at the side. And, uh, you know, anyway, I, just asked to be go, I was asked to go there, so it wasn't my choice. But, and then someone I didn't know turned around and said, what are you doing there? Come and sit down. And he kept pointing at me to go and sit down. So, okay, I went and sat down. <laughs> uh, shortly after, um, Father looks at me and he just says, like this, <laughs> stand up. And um, actually, prior to that, Dr. Bohi Park, who was translating, had already obviously uh, gone to Father and uh, explained that really I was too young and perhaps shouldn't be there. In fact, one time they'd asked me to go and then somebody else had forced me back in again. As soon as I got to the door, they said, whatever you do, don't leave, go and sit down. Right? So I felt it wasn't my will, you know, I don't mind at this stage, even if Father himself were to shout at me and say, you know, what are you doing here? Uh, that's all right, because it's not my doing. So I sat down, Father uh, asked me to stand up, and he was looking through, very deliberately looking through a, a folder of pictures. And he was looking, it felt like he was looking for someone, right? My Father was here, I was probably roughly where joy is, right? That kind of distance, right? Maybe a little bit nearer. But I couldn't see the book, right? But Father's looking through, and then he taps this one, right? And he says a few words to the translator about this uh, particular uh, sister, uh, some very complimentary things, and he's waiting for the answer. Will I accept or not? Well, I couldn't exactly say, could I have a look? <laughs> <laughs> So, I just said, yes, certainly, yes, absolutely. So, I was given a picture and then went to uh, show this to True Mother, who was interestedly kind of waiting, seeing the matches. And uh, that was the kind of introduction that we had to each other. We had, shortly after the Holy Wine Ceremony, my wife still in Korea, we didn't meet each other in person for about six months. But we wrote to each other. She didn't speak English at that time, and I didn't speak any Korean. So we had somebody on each end translating whenever the letters came. And I, had to wait, I had to wait a week or two before somebody was free to give their time to translate. And often when they translated, they would say, well, this is so deep, I can't translate it. It's so poetic. And I said, give it a try anyway. <laughs> I'd quite like to know what she's saying. <laughs> But it did give me some idea, insight into this person, and through that very pure way of getting to know somebody, actually, through exchanging letters that somebody else was bound to read because they were translating, uh, discovered this person was somebody who was sensitive to and concerned about and uh, the same things as me and thinking the same way as me and so compatible to me. And it was uh, a little while later that we went, uh, I went to Korea and had our legal wedding. At that stage, and it was a few years later in 82 that we actually had the blessing. So uh, um, uh, my wife came here in 1980 and started work here and uh, learned the language. And uh, we got to know each other over that time. And as I said, went to Madison Square Garden for the blessing in 1982. So quite an interesting uh, uh, journey that way, okay, but uh, that really was the kind of hand of God in my life to find the right uh, partner for myself. Uh, I thank God for that. And anyway, that's a kind of mixture, a little bit of a mishmash, isn't it, of you know, things that happened to me, uh, still fresh in my mind, and that's the nature of kind of experiences where you really feel uh, God is involved. Uh, so, uh, Overall, so so grateful that uh, God has uh, taken care of me and helped me, and also uh, given us a very beautiful family, which is uh, a treasure. And uh, wonderful brothers and sisters. Can you introduce your family? Well, of those who are here, uh, where is Niwa? This is Niwa, our eldest daughter, 
who is married to Boris, and they live in Berlin. And they have a daughter now, first granddaughter, is Mina. She's at home with mum. And we have uh, Patrick here, eldest son, and fourth child. And our youngest one is Mark, who's right here. <laughs> Mark. He's most of the time in the bath at the moment, studying architecture. He's, he's uh, finishing the, the completing the unfinished course of his father. Right? He's a second coming. Uh, third coming, was it? <laughs> that's right. Okay, so that's his uh, choice. So, brothers and sisters, thank you very much. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.